I just wrote? I've got a dog thing lately. <laughs> it's called I'm the boneless nighttime dog. Uh, sure, I'm terrified. I don't answer the phone. I don't peel the pears before eating them. I scrub things with my metal brush. I get sick. Sometimes I get so sick. I have this thing about geese in parks. Better not get into it. Well, uh, filler. Trying to get to the part where I let myself talk about the geese. Now seems good. Children scare geese. All the time I don't understand that. What's so good about scaring your goose? Dressed in a parka full of marbles, hiding behind a tree 100 years his senior, I watch a boy lunge like a person exercising. The goose absolutely hates it. <laughs> These boys I think grow up though, into men lingering on the edges of ponds, their hands packed with bread, throwing the white meat out in big chunks, each toss saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is a poem I wrote for my friend Charlotte, because um, uh, she, uh, I thought it was pretty funny. She told me that she got an IUD and suddenly had a lot of trouble deciding what to eat. And I thought that it was a funny idea that like you would get like stereotypical like female attributes by getting an IUD. So this is called Poem for Charlotte. <laughs> a side effect of this IUD is indecision. Increased intuition, mostly with horses, bats, and also peanut fear. Gremlin appreciation will increase. You'll become susceptible to water bribe. Dying alone, dying at all, super sudden and necessary. Giving jams away, despite your better judgment, until a five-year period of extreme jam hoarding. Possible TV offer, you'll get screwed in the contract. Loving yourself in a mirror made for a king who wore a bone earring from 1575 to 1579. This IUD will fill you with a faith in invisible things. And these are the last two. Um, the first one's like a love poem, and the second one's a heartbreak poem, which is kind of sad, I'm sorry. But it's just how it works out. <laughs> okay, uh, this wolf. Last year, I wrote about looking out the kitchen window in winter and seeing my dog eat her own shit. And I think that was probably the closest I'll ever get to expressing raw human emotion. Because yeah, it's just me and my dog, but it's more than that. It's humiliation and isolation, some lesson about bearing witness. It's my pet and her master, and how that doesn't mean anything. I wonder if every night before she falls asleep, my dog performs Lemuel's blessing with little cups of holy water. I wonder if she wishes she were like the wolf. I wonder if she and Mirwin are pen pals or lovers. I wonder if all life is, 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 is. I fall asleep in the library with my mouth hanging open, dreaming about showing you my breasts. I am unknowing, I am unknowing, I am unknowing in the face of the all-knowing dog who, in the backyard who eats her own shit because she wants to. And yeah, that's not something I think is cool or pretty. But it's something that never concerned me, I just thought it did. Naked, drinking clean water from the faucet, reveling in my own strange elation while dismissing the things that made her happy. I read that these are my wombly tetons, piercing through the darkness in this universe, which everyone seems to think is expanding, but which is actually only the size of a ball, ever since Elliot rolled it up in his anti-Semitic fist and was like, so, here it is. <laughs> and what, uh, when is someone important enough to be able to end a speech with, and thus I have spoken? At what Marriott convention will I meet the other child prophets? When will heaven fall to pieces around me as I lie back to suckle on grapelets peeling off the thin blue skins of the sky? If this is a picnic, I'm winning. <laughs> Adam, I've been wondering, at what point will I hang my arms off the ceiling fan does never stop waving at you and so reconcile all our differences? I'm alive in this dream swamp, scribbling up your calves like I have a job to do. I'm scribbling up your calves. My glasses are really loose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scribbling up your calves like my ink is a thick cement, drying right as I lay it down between the fat of your bricks. I'm scribbling like a friar with the hood pulled over his head, like it's sweet, like watching you, noticing me watching you, to ask the animal inside you what it worships. I'm, wa I'm scribbling like there's something in the water, like it's sweet, like it's your bed I scribble on, not just your calves, but the whole mattress, the white sheets, everywhere you touch when you dream of fluid things. I scribble things for you to dream about, a picture of me, my breasts I wanted to show you for your birthday, but made it seem like you had to work for it, because I thought that was more appealing, and in the dream, it was. I scribble about us on a yacht, lambasting the dental tools. I'm scribbling notes to you, sweetheart, over the bridge that makes you sweat heart. I'm scribbling the final notes of the greatest piece of music ever recorded, ever written, ever performed, unrecorded, in a cave. The piece of music that was only played once for no one but the donkey wind to hear. It's the music we feel stir up inside us when the wind's the only thing that's there. It's that music only nature heard, that final set of notes that made each blade of grass weep, drooping down to kiss the soil with their foreheads. It's when I'm haunted, haunting, and you're like, I'm not scared of that. And ours is the waterbed that contains the sea. This is the last poem. It's like the first part of a triptych about going to the Met with a lot of feelings. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read the other parts. They're not ready. 
but uh, who stalks you in the Met? I'm too self-absorbed to write ecrastic poetry. Here's a glass case containing an ancient gold crown, and all I can do is try and align my face, the reflection of my face, in such a way as to wear it. I look good. If they gave it to me, in return for the nickel I paid to get in here today, I could wear it to the Subway Sandwich restaurant I will stop at later, when I find myself too hungry to travel home alone. Now I'm choosing between describing the sandwich and the crown. Relatively tall, stacked up in a row, drippy, ahaha uh -huh, mustard, I really took you for a ride there. <laughs> I won't try and write about the urn. I know better than that, I'll just observe the penises. They're lifted by the wind, tacked onto men who run an infinite track. I think of the time I played the Chariot of Fire theme song before giving you head, marble head of an athlete. I'm crying suddenly. Why did I come to this museum alone? I remember the world remains outside. A big window in the sculpture hall gives it to me. It's always at the same hour in this city. With light, the dashed color of my crown, when I receive the world like this, as space for you to saturate. There's a guy in here whose flute broke off and now he's blowing nothing. We have that in common. <laughs> Actually, I'm surrounded by archaic torsos whom Rilke already nailed. And there's nothing more to say than yes, those are dark centers where procreation flared, and yes, absolutely, I should change my life. But how? The light followed me here. It's been following me. To the end of each day that seals itself off without you. And even if I shut my eyes, it can find me in my dreams. I'm standing at the edge of a limitless field with a stick in my hand, quietly wondering why I've patted my knees. Oh, it's a game, I realize, and that's exciting. So I reach up to adjust my helmet, but my hand rushes through it like lifting an empty gallon of milk. This helmet's defective. It's made of light. Suddenly I remember the rules. If this were a game, there would be other players. If this was a game, I could win. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Right, it's Christian from Heil. Um, well, I have to say, like, too, in, in like, um, I don't know, in the, in the nine years we've been doing it, that was one of the most heroic readings we've ever had. I mean, no mic contending with the machinery and things like that. It was fucking.